First story. A spoiled student who bullies and harasses me falsely accused me of Sama, got me fired, arrested, and ruined my whole life without any proof, just because I got her suspended for bullying. I have thought about how to write this for months now. I use the mobile app, so writing has been painful and slow. I decided to use voice to text, so my apologies if there are errors or it's difficult to read. I'm not a great writer, and I wasn't sure what to include here. There's quite a lot, so I'm sorry. About seven months ago, I received an email to report to the district office and to bring a union representative. I'll never forget the feeling of confusion and terror as I was told I was being put on administrative leave. My representative asked why, and so did I, and they told me it was under investigation. Two hellish days passed, and I received a call to report again to the district office the next morning. The only two people in the meeting were HR and a lawyer. They asked me a series of yes or no questions. Did you ever touch students' hands, backs, or necks? Did you ever call students honey or sweetie? Did you touch a student thigh when cleaning up coffee? It was so ridiculous. I wanted to scream, but I answered calmly and assertively no to each question. I remember an incident where I spilled coffee all over the reading table. I was giving kids instructions on Chromebooks and knocked it clean over everything, and I tried to clean it up. I was a 7th grade math teacher, and I was helping 6th grade students with math intervention. There was a janitor and a classroom teacher in the room. The coffee spilled on the student's clothes, and I helped one student wipe it off her with a paper towel. This is all I could think of for why this could be happening. I told them the story. I told them it was an accident, and that I never touched a student inappropriately. I asked them what I was being accused of, and the lawyer just motioned her hand to the computer screen and said, All of this. I was told I was being terminated or I could resign. My union rep was furious, but couldn't do anything as I was a probationary teacher. This is my second year teaching and my eighth year working in education. I had perfect reviews from all of my employment and scored high in all of my observations. I was well liked by students and teachers. I was so happy when I got my first job teaching. I called my mom and cried. She was proud of me because she knew how much I struggled in life my dad passed when I was 13 and I worked extremely hard to become a teacher like the one who helped me when I was in high school. She passed away my first year there from lung cancer. Many of the kids were great, and many of them were terrible. Kids can be terrible to young teachers. They made fun of my mom dying. I had students touch my hair, throw staplers at me, and swear at me daily. In my first year, the administration had no control over student behavior. We collectively, as teachers, wrote thousands of behavior referrals with little to no consequences. There was a student who spent half the year suspended, and she ended up having to repeat the seventh grade. I had her twice. She was terrible to me and all the teachers. Early in the first year, she accused me out of the blue one day of being a pedophile, and then I was staring at students. I was totally mortified and disturbed by this, which just egged her on. She continued for no reason other than that it made me upset, and she was suspended for harassing me. I found out later that she has a terrible home life, and she's probably the victim of abuse herself. I think this is where it started. I was from a bigger city nearby. I am a musician and an artist, and some of the students definitely thought that I was weird. After that accusation, the group of disciplinary students held onto this accusation as a way to torture me. I learned to ignore what they said and report it to the administration. Nothing was ever done. Half of the teachers in my building at the small rural school quit or retired after that first year, including the vice principal and the principal. Fast forward to my second year the year that this happened. The new principal was young. It was her first year as a principal. She shared with teachers at a PD earlier in the year that she was a victim of SA as a child. I thought it was strange that she shared it at the time, but I was very sympathetic. There were a lot of kids in our building who had gone through abuse, and some of their stories had me in tears daily. The second year was going a lot better. As a second year teacher, I was finally able to focus on my teaching and curriculum instead of student behavior. The administration set up a special room for students to go to when they were having mental health crises. We only had one counselor in the building. Then the student from before who had been suspended came back in the middle of the year. Suddenly she was in my class again, and she would daily swear at me and call me names. I was more experienced this time and more calmly handled her outbursts and harassment of me and other students. Things began to change in my classes though students were more combative. I was thinking of getting out of teaching despite my $100,000 in student loan debt and the fact that I lived paycheck to paycheck. I was an up-and-coming artist and had just gone on a small tour with a more famous act opening for them in the three sold-out shows. 
I had spent 15 years playing music, and it seemed finally it was starting to pay off. I played those sold-out shows in February, and it was in March that I was called down to the office. I found out through teachers that there had been a presentation at the school about good touch and bad touch. Shortly after that, multiple students who were all close friends made complaints against me that I touched their arms, held their hands, and touched their thighs. These were 6th grade students who I pushed in with. There was always a group of 10 or more, and the way to school was set up in fishbowl classrooms with large windows at the front of each room. One of the 6th grade teachers said they told her they didn't like my class and didn't want to go anymore. She thinks that's why they made the complaints. Two of my 7th grade students made complaints, one of them being that I forcefully grabbed her breast on four different occasions in class. Mind you, this is a class of 20 students in advanced math. This student, whom I later recalled, had poor grades from not handing in work and was struggling. Two of her friends had also been caught cheating on a test. I only learned of her accusations secondhand from teachers. All of the teachers at the school support me and know that this was wrong. A former teacher of hers has confirmed she made up lies about students to get them in trouble on multiple occasions. After only two days of investigation, they fired me essentially forcing me to resign. I felt like I had no choice. Two of the teachers heard the student who made the accusation of me grabbing her breast and bragging about it in class say, that's all it took to get him fired. However, both of those teachers were afraid of district retaliation. If they were to say anything, they reported it to the office. But they refused to help me. I couldn't find a job, so I had to take an under-the-table job working on a farm. I hurt my back. I found out now that I have carpal tunnel syndrome, which affects my playing. There was nothing I could do otherwise. Most other jobs required a background check, and I was never called back. Two months after I was terminated, I received a call from the police saying that they just wanted to talk to me about what happened. I didn't know this then. But for anyone who ever finds themselves talking to the police, please, please, please have a lawyer. Two detectives put me in a small room, gave me a fake lie detector test, and told me I was lying about touching a student's breast. They called me a monster and a pedophile, and they interrogated me for two hours. I told them the same damn thing over and over again. I didn't do anything wrong to anyone. I have never harmed a student in my life and only wanted to help students. I stayed and talked to them on my own volition and waived my Miranda rights. I could have left any time, but I waited until their questions were over. They told me they would contact me, but they had big cases, so it might be a while. Flash forward two months later. I had a lawyer now who said it didn't seem like they had anything on me and that most likely I wouldn't be charged but they weren't sure. I'm a dad of two kids, and I was working 50-60 hour weeks to get enough overtime to pay for all my bills. I also had big shows lined up for festivals. I was finally starting to gain recognition as a musician. It was right before one of these festivals. I received a call that I was being charged with SA against a minor, a misdemeanor that carries a year of jail time and would be a registrable offense. The terror, pain, and horror that went through my body, I cannot begin to describe. I then talked to my lawyer, who is not yet on retainer. She calls the detective, who then tells her I am no longer being charged. This was very strange, and my lawyer was very confused. She said maybe they had been lying as a bluff to get me to come in, and to try to get me to say something that would incriminate myself. I kept going with my life, wondering what I would do now that the one profession I trained for eight years was no longer available to me. I hadn't known yet at this point that my teaching license was suspended. I've been taking medication to treat my ADHD. I was starting to go to the gym. I played a show in front of thousands of people at a big festival. I was in the middle of a job interview for a charter school, and they wanted to hire me. Then my whole world came crashing down. I received a call at work. It was my lawyer. They were now officially charging me, and I had to turn myself in. I had long hair. I got a haircut, went to the county sheriff's office, had my mug shot taken, and was fingerprinted. Again, I can't describe to you how horrific this was for me. It was later that night that my face was put on multiple news outlets. I didn't know until I woke up the next morning. On every local radio show, every local TV station, and on Facebook, there were posts with my face. Some news articles even included the street that I lived on. In a few hours, my life was over. I had to move apartments because I was afraid for mine and my children's lives. They are with me part-time, but I've always been there for them and have a great relationship with the mom as a co-parent. My girlfriend and I play music together, and we have many of the same friends. The farmer I work for supported me, but said I couldn't work there anymore. The job that I was in line for couldn't move forward because my fingerprints wouldn't clear. 
so I had no way to make money to pay for my apartment, food, or for my kids. I had a big show in the city, with someone who toured with Sufjan Stevens a very popular folk artist that I had to call him up and cancel. He had already heard the news from a friend. Some people on Facebook made posts and tagged all of my friends, saying how they could be friends with me. I was afraid to go outside. I started having panic attacks. I started having self-harming thoughts. I had to scramble to find work under the table on Craigslist just to survive. Luckily, my sister was able to pay the $10,000 retainer for the lawyer. But my family is not a rich family. My sister worked very hard to be in that position to help my siblings if we needed it, as both of our parents have passed. Me and the mom of my kids had to tell my children, who are aged 11 and 9, that someone lied about their dad, and now he couldn't be a teacher anymore. We did this with a therapist to make it easier on them. I would spend hours online looking at articles about myself and my horrible mugshot. I download apps to see who unfriended me on Facebook and Instagram. I couldn't play music for weeks. The anxiety attacks became worse to the point where I couldn't go shopping or take care of myself. I'm now on medication to help with anxiety. I still struggle with life every day. I could go on about how there's no evidence against me and how my life has been completely ruined. I wish the principal had just talked to me instead of listening to students and, one day later, forcing me to resign. If convicted of this, I'd be a registered SX offender. I wouldn't be able to go to my kids' school events. I had to miss open house this year for my daughter in fourth grade because some people in their school district found out what happened. I could go on and say how horrible the conditions were at the school and how every teacher they have supports me. How to teachers heard the student bragging and that she was lying. But the few that heard her were so afraid of district retaliation, they said they couldn't help me. Luckily, a few of her former teachers are willing to testify for me that she has lied to others in trouble before. I'm in limbo, waiting for the legal process to play out, and I have no idea where I'll be one year from now. Most days when I'm not working under the table, I am sitting and staring at the wall, drinking and crying, unable to get out of bed. I went through so much in my life to get here. I worked so hard for many years to be an effective teacher and a successful musician for everything to suddenly be taken away from me. Even though I'm confident in my case, legally the DA office admitted to having basically no evidence, my life will never be the same. I'm not sure how I can continue living, knowing my life will always be defined by this and the damage it has done. I'm in a constant fog. I haven't seen any of my friends, and I wonder what else I can say to them when I do. Will I always just be thought of as a mugshot and an accusation? What is the meaning of my life now? Everyone I talk to thinks I'm guilty, and I can't discuss the details of the case, so there's no way to defend myself. I wish I had never become a teacher. Relevant comments. Dakraka 2211. Man, I'm not saying you're lying, but you've got at least five separate girls making accusations, spanning multiple grades, and you were fired and are now facing charges. Something is not adding up. Either you're the most unlucky guy ever, or you're leaving parts of the story out. OP. 6th and 7th graders were all in the same friend group. It's a small, rural school. I've been called pretty unlucky. My mom died the year before this, in January 2022. As I said before, it started with a disturbed student who made comments about me being a pervert. And some kids held on to that as a way to make fun of me. What do you think I'm leaving out? Do you think I touched a 12-year-old's breast four times in one month in a class of 20-plus students? That's what she claimed. It's written down in documents in the initial discovery. She later changed it from three times to four times. The sixth graders said that during instruction in a fishbowl windowed room, mind you, I held their hands for minutes at a time and told them, it's going to be okay, called them honey and sweetie, and touched their backs and necks. I never even hugged students or high school students then. Only fist bumps. My friends and teacher friends know I've never called anyone honey or sweetie in my life. They didn't like my class, and I was definitely more of a disciplinarian then. The principal interviewed them one by one after they went to office and immediately called parents. That was the school's entire investigation, to my knowledge. I'm replying here because I know people are going to say this in the future, and I want to be able to respond. Part of me really wants this public because if you saw all the facts, I think you'd see everything everyone else in my life has seen. This is bullsh tea. I've always had a problem standing up for myself, but I'm trying to do it now because this is my entire life on the line. Ask me any questions because, on the one hand, I empathize with your skepticism, or at least I'm not surprised by it. I might be saying the same things if the situation were reversed. Lamindetamame. So I guess my questions come from years of union experience. I wonder sometimes how the people I've sat in meetings with, representing them, 
who definitely did the things, would tell their stories. Where was your union? What evidence did they have? HR and the district have a burden of proof. Not for the termination of a probationary teacher, but for the rest, like reporting you to law enforcement. That's not done willy-nilly. There are complicated processes, usually involving your union and a union lawyer. OP. In my first encounter with the superintendent, he was yelling at teachers for making side comments about masks in our back-to-school district meeting. This was a full dad figure yell to an auditorium of 200 adult professionals. He basically scolded everyone, saying we weren't acting like teachers. Everyone in the union was appalled, and every teacher was appalled. The union met afterward and talked about admin union tensions, and they just seemed so defeated. Early on, I was warned by multiple teachers and even union reps that the district is vindictive. It seemed like a former superintendent was especially heavy-handed. I wondered sometimes what the union did for me besides an average healthcare package. This is a very rural district, and unions were notably not viewed as strong. I was told by my rep, who wasn't technically a rep, but a former rep the district said they wanted that people were getting let go or moved in the district, and are building quite a lot recently. He fully believed me, and even got into an argument with the district lawyer about what exactly their investigation was turns out. Writing down what students said, and then calling their parents, I found out months later. He said he wanted to help, but they gave us no choice. I wish I had let them terminate me. But my rep and I both thought at that time, no criminal charges were being pursued attorney for the school district's words, and that I could get a different teaching job. Resigning is better. Edit update in the same post. I can't thank you enough for reading and giving your perspective, support, and advice. Being unable to share with friends and people that aren't super close to me. I have felt so alone in this, and this is literally one of the first times I've felt hurt. To address some comments, the case is ongoing, and I have been through the arraignment. The two teacher aides who directly heard the student bragging about getting me fired told me they reported it to the admin, but didn't want to talk to a detective because they are only a few years away from retirement and the district is vindictive. I have Facebook Messenger screenshots. I know now that they can be subpoenaed. Many teachers who know me have reached out, and many have offered their willingness to testify. My lawyer sat down with the ADA who said the case has mostly been pursued because the family was pushing. The SRO at the school took a statement from the principal, who just repeated what the kid said, which is their primary evidence. This is a small community, and I learned the SRO also worked closely with the lead investigator in my case, as they both work on the same tactical unit at the sheriff's department. Another teacher told me that the SRO's wife was heard saying how anyone could think I was innocent, because the investigation took so long it took so long, because they called me and never left a message so I didn't speak to anyone for months. I'm not sure if this matters, but I'm thinking there was a huge bias from the start in the sheriff's office. I don't want to get political, but a teacher friend shared with me that the family is apparently known for making excuses for the students and are staunch Trump supporters who generally dislike teachers. Several teachers offered to come to my arrangement for support, but I said it was okay because it was supposed to be quick, according to my lawyer. Well, it turns out the student's dad came, and was in the same tiny village courtroom with me and my lawyer. We later agreed it was unnecessary, and it seemed threatening. He was there in the back of the living room-sized court. It was tense, but I made eye contact with him and kept my head up. He now knows my address because I had to say it out loud in court. He waited in the parking lot with his pickup parked right next to me. When I left, it felt very tense. I hope he realizes someday that his daughter lied. The same teacher friend said if her parents did know she was lying. They probably wouldn't want people to know that, but I have a huge hope that she or the other students will admit that they made it up and lied to get out of my class or to get me fired. I will be taking no plea deal of any kind, and I already have plans to file lawsuits against the school, students' families, district, and possibly the sheriff's department. However, as some people here pointed out, winning a civil suit won't be easy or, in some cases, possible. I will still try. I want justice for me and for everyone in my life, including my children girlfriend, and family. Lastly, I need to say that I hope my story does not harm Saw victims by making their stories seem less credible. Saw can and does happen at a school like mine, and victims need to be heard. Me and other teachers notice, it's usually by a family member. We have heard about it, seen evidence of it, reported it, and many, many times nothing happens. Victims need support and need to be believed. These kids have used allegations as a weapon because, at the end of the day, Men and women do abuse kids in the first place, and it's why we are so reactive as a society, and they know that at some level. However, teachers are way too vulnerable to false allegations without any evidence.
My administration was so quick to throw my life away to cover themselves against potential future criticism, knowing that getting rid of me this way couldn't be held liable. They took no care to get the facts or to even talk to me at all. I'm in a living hell because, no matter what the facts said, I was guilty immediately, without question. I don't think I can write or respond anymore. I might try another day. Thank you for reading this. Second story. My brother's girlfriend sawed, abused, and physically assaulted him, so I called the cops. They took her side and arrested my brother. Then she harassed him even more, threatening to get him arrested again. Now I see him breaking down over not being involved in his daughter's life, while being blamed as an abuser. He doesn't know I made the call, and I'm scared he will cut ties with me if I open up. Sorry, this is a long one, but I need to vent, and I don't really have any other place to go. Not many people know about this particular era in my brother's life, and I am certain that those that do would tell him if I told them the truth. So here you go. My F-35 older brother M-41 just left my house in tears. His daughter starts kindergarten this fall, and he wanted to be one of the parent volunteers for after-school activities and camps. He was denied because of an arrest that happened in 22. This was the second time my brother has completely broken down in front of me. The first being just after this arrest. This kills me because all of it is entirely my fault. He still doesn't know that it was me who called the police that day. For context, our parents divorced when I was 13 and my brother was 19. He had a house that he rented. And while our parents' divorce was mostly amicable, our mom was dragging it out forever. And I wasn't handling it well. My brother offered to let me stay with him until the dust settled. He dropped me off at school every morning on his way to work, made sure I got to my after-school activities, and most of all, kept me from losing my mind in a very difficult and turbulent time in my life. We would spend countless hours in the garage while he worked on his cars. I would rant about my silly teenage life, and he would teach me everything about the work he was doing. No matter how stupid or superficial my problem was, he always had words of comfort. Even if I was completely in the wrong on something or completely overreacting, he would let me know it, but without being a DCK about it. I saw a kind, compassionate, and dedicated man in him instead of the distant, somewhat mean older brother he'd always been before this. He was the absolute rock I needed at that point in my life. I started to see that he's been that rock for everyone that came into his life. I truly believe my brother is one of the few genuinely good people on this earth. But holy SHT. Did he have terrible taste in women or terrible luck with women? I had been living with my brother for almost a year when he started dating Kara F-18, and he was 20. They met at a bonfire, and within a few weeks, she was basically living at his place. The arguments started almost immediately. She would scream at him until all hours of the morning, throwing things or just generally smashing the place up. He never even yelled back. He kept the same even tone our father would use when our mom was upset about anything. When SHT got bad, he would just leave the house for a few hours. Leaving Kara alone with me. I hated them both for this. I left my parents' house because the tension in the air was suffocating. At my brother's house, it was becoming crushing. It wasn't long before he started coming home from being with her, with black eyes and bruises or scratches all over his face and arms. I asked him why he put up with her SHT. He told me that she thinks she's pregnant, and he wasn't going to be a deadbeat, absentee father, no matter how much Kara pushed him to be. I asked him why he kept sleeping with her. He responded that he didn't want to, but the fight wouldn't end until he just let her have her way. She just wouldn't let him sleep if they didn't make up. He told me that even if he managed to fall asleep, he'd wake up with her on top of him doing it away. I asked him why he never called the police. He told me that was only going to make it worse. So many times, he'd reach a limit and break up with her, pregnant or not. Once, he even changed the locks to which Kara responded by going on a week-long drinking bender, resulting in the loss of the pregnancy. A few weeks later, the same cycle was repeating. She'd get pregnant. She'd start fights. She'd get violent. She'd binge drink, abuse drugs, or do something to lose the baby. They'd make up, grieve, and settle back in. Rise, wash, and repeat for months. Sometimes he'd break up with her somewhere in the cycle, but really only at the beginning. It always made her escalate. They'd only been together for six months but I could see the life draining from my brother's eyes with every repetition. He really was never the same person again. He started smoking pot every day. Most of his social circle evaporated. He went from this motivated, always busy, ambitious young man to kind of a stoner burnout. To the point. One December morning, my brother was out back working on his E30 BMW. This car was his pride and joy. He bought it for $500 in 1998. 
It was a complete bucket of SHT. It barely ran, and it looked like it had spent its glory days completely submerged. Over the years, he had completely overhauled it. He fixed the rotting interior. He cut out and replaced the rusty bodywork. He painted and repainted it at least half a dozen times until it was just right. He'd fixed how terribly it ran, replaced the transmission and clutch, added a turbo, and done a million other things he said it needed to support it. Right when he and Kara started dating, the motor threw a rod. My brother found a replacement motor from a newer 3 Series and was in the process of installing it when Kara happened. Kara absolutely hated that car. She'd tell him often in arguments that he loved that stupid BMW more than he loved her. My brother barely had a chance to work on it once she came into the picture. Those months were the longest the car had ever sat without running since he first had it towed home. I was in my bedroom, and my brother was out working on the car. I heard Kara yelling as she came up the driveway. I couldn't make out what she was saying, but I could tell she was already amped up. I looked out from my window and saw her start hitting the car with a four-foot breaker bar. She'd smashed out the headlights and the windshield and was starting on the rest of the car. My brother just sat there, watching her do this. Every crunch and smash sent a cold spike down my spine. It was hard to watch, but I couldn't look away. Then she spun around and started hitting my brother. At first, with her bare hand, she knocked him and slapped him in the head. This was nothing new. In fact, this was a pretty common thing when she got this mad. But then she hauled back the breaker bar and cracked him in the side with it. He crumpled over from his chair onto the garage floor. That's when I grabbed the phone and called the police. Also, when it gets blurry, I know I told the operator that my brother's girlfriend was trying to kill him. I know I told them to hurry. I left the phone off the hook and started to run outside to do I don't really know something. My brother came barreling through the back door, slamming it behind him, his entire face and shirt soaked with blood. Kara got there just as he turned the deadbolt. She was screaming, banging, and kicking on the door. It was honestly inhuman. There was a fire in her eyes that just terrified me. I ran back to my room and hung up the phone. At some point, Kara went back to beating on the car. My brother just sat on the kitchen floor with his back pressed against the back door. The police arrived, and the noise stopped. I remember my brother cursing under his breath when the neighbors called the cops. I kept my mouth shut. After a few minutes, an officer knocked on the front door. My brother opened the door, and without a moment's hesitation, one officer grabbed him, shoved him against the railing, and another handcuffed him. They loaded him in the back of one car, and then both police cars pulled away. To my utter horror, Kara was still standing out front. She just got in her own car and left. A week later, my brother came home. He had a few broken ribs and a severe concussion. Kara told the police he had attacked her first, an absolute lie. The cops held him in interrogation for hours, and then in a holding cell for days. He was arraigned, but the charges against him were eventually dropped. The damage was already done. Kara told everyone that she dropped the charges because her baby needed a daddy, even if he was shy. Another absolute lie. What few friends he had left abandoned him. To everyone on the fringes of his once expansive social circle, he was just the arsy hole who tried to hit a girl. In the week my brother was locked up, he got fired from his job at the shop. He ended up abandoning his lease in March, and both of us moved back in with our dad. Mom had moved out of our dad's house by this point, so it was just the three of us. And sometimes, Kara. She told my brother that she'd get him locked up again whenever she wanted if he acted up or tried to leave her. Kara never ended up having a baby, thank God. I don't know if it was because of miscarriages or if she was just making the whole thing up. He may have survived the beating, but she killed him that day. For months, I would hear him crying at night, and it almost killed me too. My brother struggled to get a job for a while, but eventually ended up doing car audio stuff. He took a night job delivering pizzas, too. Kara spent the next year or so making his life hellish. He would come home every couple of weeks with a bandaged arm or a black eye. She got him fired from the pizza place because she would show up and start arguments with him while he was working. She made him quit the car audio gig because the boss wouldn't let her in the service bay. He hopped around from shop to shop for a while, working as a mechanic's apprentice, a parts driver, or whatever he could find always keeping at least one job, if not two. When he was working a lot, she would berate him and start fights over how he was working too much, and they never saw each other. When he wasn't working, or working only one job, she'd berate him about not being able to pay for her SHT. He didn't care. He didn't care about much of anything, really. He just went to work, came home to smoke pot, and slept. That was it. Slowly, 
Kara stopped coming around as much. Eventually, she was just gone. I don't know if she got bored or whatever. Or if she found a new guy. I can't really say I care. My brother spent a long time in a pretty dark place. He never talked about it. But the dramatic shift in his personality over that year made it pretty clear to me. He never fixed the damage she did to his car. He got it running at some point, but never fixed the body work. It mostly sat for the next decade before he sold it. After Kara was gone, he was able to hold steady work again. But he never strived to do much more than entry-level stuff. He never really had any real friendships after this, either. He'd never admit it. But for someone who was so social before, he had to be lonely. It took a long time 2009. But eventually my brother started dating again. He met his wife in 2010. She was a great partner for him. He quit smoking pot and started to actually get his life together. He went back to school in 2015 and now has an engineering degree. He took his arse to therapy and started to get some of this SHT out. They had their child in 2018. He has been the absolute best dad for her. When their daughter came along, it was like my old self got woken up again. I've never seen him so happy as he is when they're playing together or when she helps her papa fix something on the cars or around the house. He is so involved with everything she does that, of course, he'd want to volunteer at her school. And then he finds out that he can't. And all I can see is that broken, bloodied young man trying not to cry. I know it's not just about volunteering. It's also about how all the other parents, the teachers, and the staff are going to perceive him if this background check is all they know about him. My brother is devastated by all of this, and more so by how it might affect his daughter. He still doesn't know it was me who called the cops. I know I didn't technically do anything wrong, but I can't help but wonder what would have been different if I hadn't. I know Kara's lies did this to him. I know Kara's abuse did this to him. I know it's not my fault. I just don't know how my brother would react if I told him the truth. I'm afraid he'll never speak to me again. I just can't keep this secret anymore. So here you go, Reddit. Thanks for listening. Relevant comments. Gimme underscore super underscore head. There shouldn't be anything on his record if the charges are dropped. Also, did the police not question you when they arrested him? Did nobody else see this horrible beating happening? Why was he in jail for so long? OP. No, the police never asked me any questions. I don't think anyone else saw. The garage was tucked behind the house, and there was a wooden fence around the yard. I don't know why he still has this on his record. Another person here suggested petitioning to have it expunged, so I will talk to my brother about this and see if he can do that and maybe figure out why this is still there at all. Antisocial underscore Firefly. These were all thoughts I had, too. You were there. You saw it all happen. Did they not question you? If not, they were doing a crappy job of getting to the truth. Especially when he was the only one covered in blood. I have several brothers, and I can't imagine watching someone abuse one of them over and over and continue getting away with it, and watching him caught in a cycle he couldn't break free from. I'm so glad to hear he's now in a great relationship with a daughter he adores. On another note, because those charges were dropped, there should not be anything on his record. I recently read in an article that someone who was falsely accused of a crime also requested his fingerprints be destroyed. I would encourage him to look into why it's still on his record. It could be a simple clerical error. As for telling him you were the one who called the police, I think you should tell him and explain how scared you were. She might actually do more than just beat him that time. OP. I was a tiny 14-year-old, and Kara terrified me. She also hated me. I was scared that she'd attack me every time I had to be alone in that house with her. Yes, it was hard to see it all happen, but I felt like I couldn't intervene without making it much worse for my brother and for me. I used to fantasize a lot about stuffing a pillow over her face while she slept. Well, therapy while I was in college, and after has helped me come to terms with some of that guilt. Thank you for watching the video. If you are interested in listening to these kinds of stories, we've got more in store for you. Simply subscribe to our channel, hit the like button, and share it with your friends.